I would argue that Britain had reason to fight the First World War. I think we need to look at those reasons. And I think we need to look at them treating history with respect. Um, Dominic Sandbrook and John Charmley have both talked about how we must have hard historical facts. In fact, what they've given us is a great many um, confections of interpretation. What they've also done is, is turn their faces firmly against counterfactuals, but it seems to me they have produced an enormous counterfactual. We see a picture of a happy Europe, united, harmonious, Kaiser Wilhelm II, a sort of banky moon of the continent, <laughs> smiling benevolently around, bringing peace, getting the Serbs under control, uh, running the German Empire. By the way, I, I don't think saying that Germany and Southwest Africa is a good example of, of how Germany was really a rather moderate colonial power is perhaps the one I would have chosen. Um, speak to the Herero about that, most of whom were destroyed in the German colonial wars. Um, Joseph Goebbels, Joseph, uh, Hermann Goering's father, actually, the governor of Southwest Africa. Um, but that is a side track. I'm not going to go into counterfactuals, but let us remember what the world was like in 1914. And let us not patronize those who had to make what were very, very difficult decisions at the time. We know how the story turned out. And so it's very easy for us to say what fools they were. They should have known that Passchendaele was on the way. They should have known that Verdun was going to happen. They should have known that Ypres was going to happen. They should have known that the first day of the Somme was coming. That, it seems to me, is like saying that those who started the Industrial Revolution should have known that we were going to get climate change in the 21st century. We can't read back into the past what we know happened. Yes, we know that the war turned into a stalemate. And it was a dreadful war in many ways. But that was not what people knew at the time. And I think we must be very, very careful to separate that out. And I think what we need to do is look at what faced those who had to make the decision in Britain in 1914. We don't actually know what was said in the cabinet debates terribly well, because there is no record of those. But what we can see from the diaries of people at the time is that they agonized over the decision. It was not an easy decision. And they weighed many of the questions that we have been weighing here tonight. What was at issue for Britain in 1914 were a number of things. And I think it's very important, again, to remember that and to treat those who had to make the decisions with the respect that they deserve. They did not make these decisions lightly. These were not a bunch of upper-class toffs saying, let's send a whole lot of boys over to France and see what happens. I and mean, these were people who thought very seriously about what it meant and, and thought very seriously about the alternatives before them. The issues in 1914 were not about fighting for democracy. I mean, that is absolutely wrong. People didn't go in to the First World War thinking they were fighting for democracy, nor did they go in, if I may disagree with that great historian Michael Gove, saying we are fighting for a liberal international order. <laughs> you did not see people lining up outside the recruiting statements saying, goodbye, mother, I'm off to fight for a liberal international order. <laughs> What they thought they were fighting for were a number of things. They thought they were fighting for the rights of small nations, and that meant Belgium. The German plans called for an invasion of Belgium, which was a neutral country. Its neutrality had been guaranteed by the European powers, including Germany itself. That was what really swayed David Lloyd George, who was one of the leading anti-war figures in the cabinet up until the summer of 1914. He wrote to his wife in North Wales and said, we cannot stand by and see the rights of small nations violated like this. And I think there was a very strong sense in Britain at the time that Belgium was defenseless. It was attacked unprovoked by Germany. The Germans sent an ultimatum to the Belgian government saying, we want you to show that you will be friends with us, so would you please hand over your frontier forts and let us go through and attack France. And the Belgians chose to resist and paid a terrible price for that. We now know that it was not all propaganda about German atrocities in Belgium during the First World War. A, number of, a large number of Belgian civilians were shot out of hand, large numbers taken against all the laws of war to do forced labor in Germany. The ancient and beautiful library at Louvain was deliberately burnt by German soldiers, enraged by the fact that they were encountering resistance from this small country. Britain also had obligations to France. It had built up those obligations over a number of years, it had held military conversations with the French in which the British had said, look, we will, when a war starts, send our troops to this place, to this railway depot. What arrangements will you make? The French had every reason to expect that a British force would come to their aid. Similar naval arrangements. The French had pulled 
a lot of their ships into the Mediterranean to protect sea lanes in the Mediterranean, assuming that the British would defend the French coasts along the Channel and in, uh, in, in, the, in the Atlantic. More than that, there was a general sense that the British and French worked together. And so the French did have reason to think that the British were with them, were on their side. And please let us remember, France did not attack Germany. In fact, the French government pulled its troops back 20 kilometers from the frontiers in order to avoid any provocation. It was Germany that attacked France without any provocation whatsoever. So there were moral responsibilities. I, I would argue there were not legal responsibilities, but certainly responsibilities that built up over the years. I think there was also the question of British interests. Was it really in British interest to let Germany dominate the continent? The British, yes, have wanted a balance of power in Europe, but what they have not wanted is a single hegemon. That's why they went into the Napoleonic Wars, to prevent that happening. That's why they formed coalitions against Louis XIV. That's why they saw they had to go into the First World War, and that's why they saw they had to go into the Second World War. More than that, the British felt, and I think this was not just those sitting in Whitehall, this was the people who went to join up, including my own ancestors, who felt they were defending something important. They felt they were defending a way of life, they felt they were defending home and hearth, they felt they were defending values which they thought were important. Let's not treat them with condescension. They thought they were fighting for something important. And let us think of what Germany might have been if it had won. This is not a counterfactual, these, these are strong probabilities. Germany was an uneasy country, it was not the militaristic nation of caricature, but it was a nation in play. There were different forces within Germany, that yes, there was a growing socialist party, yes, there were German liberals, but there was a very, very strong and reactionary upper class, many of whom saw war as a very good opportunity to get rid of all the things they didn't like. As soon as the war broke out, the Kaiser and his circle were talking about getting rid of the Reichstag, suspending the Constitution, and in a very sinister foretaste of what was going to come, rounding up the Jews and getting them out of finance, limiting the power of what some reactionary Germans saw as too powerful um, German-Jewish uh, German finance. And it was not a country that was necessarily going to be well disposed towards Britain. If Germany had dominated the country, would it have held out a friendly hand to Britain? I don't think so. Britain and Germany were already trade rivals. The Germans had started a naval race with Britain, knowing that for Britain, the navy was its shield and its defense and the way in which it linked to its empire and protected the British Isles. It had already tried to stir up trouble in the British Empire. The idea that Germany would have said to the British, a triumphant Germany would have said to the British, hang on to your empire, we don't care about it, is wrong. The Germans had been intriguing with Indian nationalists who had been to Berlin, who had been encouraged by the Kaiser. And the Kaiser is not just a comic opera figure, he's a meddlesome and dangerous figure who spoke too much and said too many things, but that doesn't make him any the less dangerous. The Kaiser had proclaimed himself already in the 1890s the protector of all Muslims around the world. And of course he was going to call a jihad almost as soon as the war started to encourage the Muslim citizens of the British and French empires to rise up against them. And so to assume that this would have been a benevolent Germany who would have said to the British, war's over, we've got the French under our control, we've annexed Belgium and the Netherlands, we've basically dominating the center of Europe, Austria-Hungary is, is now under control. Keep your empire, we're friends, we don't really wish you any harm. I think we're dreaming, and I think our opponents are dreaming if they think that. And let us also remember what British entry into the war did. And this is not, again, a counterfactual. The British expeditionary force turned the tide at a time when it looked like France was going to be defeated. We will never know how close we came to a repeat of the summer of 1940, but without the British expeditionary force, without the first Battle of the Marne, I think it is highly likely that Germany had won. So were the costs too high? We can't know. And it is not for us to tell those people then that the costs were too high. But they were no higher in terms of lives lost than they had been in the Napoleonic Wars. In terms of British population at the time, 10 million British in, in, the, in, the, in the period of the Napoleonic Wars, over 300,000 dead. In the, in the First World War, 46 million people in the British Isles and almost half a million dead. And that, of course, isn't including the empire as well. The empire paid a very heavy price but speaking as a Canadian, we didn't think that price was too high. And so I think the motion should be defeated. <laughs>